Hey guys, good evening. Um, we're back in chapter 10, part three. So um, just a couple of loose ends, right? So um, if we go back and look at the, um, the rotational inertia, um, we looked at it for a point mass and we actually, uh, we actually derived that. And so for a point mass, it's MR squared, where M is the mass of the point, uh, point mass, and R is the distance from the axis of rotation. So um, I'm not gonna go through on how to calculate um, rotational inertia for, um, for continuous mass distributions. It involves, uh, you know, some, some somewhat serious calculus, but there is a table, right, that I want you to be familiar with, uh, table 10-2, um, which is a list, a list of, of rotational inertias for various, for various shapes. Okay, so um, so for instance, if if one were to have a a tuna can, for instance, right? So if one were to have a um, this is going to be a solid a solid cylinder, and if the axis of rotation is down through the cylinder. And then the I for the, for the cylinder then is going to be one half M R squared, where R is the radius and M is the mass. Okay, so um, if we were to have a hoop, so this would be a, a hoop. Okay, um, of mass M. So this is a hoop, a hoop of mass. And again, um, this is gonna be some, some radius R and the hoop is thin. So this is a very thin hoop of mass. Then the rotational inertia of the hoop is actually equal to MR squared, which is the same as a point mass. And the last one that I'll, that I'll, um, that I'll draw out here is a solid, a solid sphere. So if this is a solid, a solid sphere of radius R and mass M, then the rotational inertia of the sphere is equal to two fifths MR squared. So um, again, you're beginning to see that for these, uh, for these highly um, symmetrical objects, right? We have, um, you know, we have some coefficient out in front, right? Times MR squared. Um, where the coefficient here is going to be, you know, less than or equal to less than or equal to one. Okay, so um, so again, the units the units on the rotational inertia are going to be kilograms times meter squared, not kilograms per meter squared, but kilograms times meter squared. Okay, and so um, again, going uh, going back uh, here, um, just want you to take a look at table uh, ten dash two, um, just to familiarize yourself with those. As always, um, we're not asking that you do any memorization of uh, rotational inertias. Okay, all right, just wanted to um, to 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 highlight those.
All right, so, so next, right, we want to, um, we want to talk about, we want to talk about how we get objects to get into rotational motion, okay? And so let's take a, let's take a really simple case, okay? And we're going to take our point mass, we're going to take our point mass M, again, which is tethered by a, a light but rigid support. And we can think of this being initially at, at rest. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna, we're gonna come in here and slap this with a force, okay? So we're gonna come in here and slap this with a, with a force, right? Looking down, this could very well be a, you know, a hockey puck, which is uh, tethered by a, a really light rod, come in here and slap that, that hockey puck with a hockey stick. And then I'm going to look at the uh, ensuing motion. Okay, so, so again, this is, this is going to then move on a, uh, move on a circular path. Okay, and so this is going to be uh, moving um, at some fixed radius some fixed radius from, from an axis of rotation. Okay, the axis of rotation is gonna be at the origin, okay? And so we wanna ask ourselves, right, uh, some questions about this. We can certainly go to Newton's second law. We can certainly go to Newton's second law. And we can say that Again, um, looking at the net force on this object. Okay, so the only force, the only force at play here is this, this force here. We'll just call it F. Okay, and so we have we have F is equal to the object's mass times the acceleration, and the acceleration in this case, right, is going to be an acceleration which is going to be in this direction. And so the acceleration is going to be tangential in nature, okay? Because it's tangent to the object's motion, okay? So it's tangential, um, tangential acceleration, okay? And so there's nothing wrong with this formula. It's Newton's second law. Newton's second law is uh, by all means uh, valid. Um, but what we'd like to do here is, is um, is, is cast this in terms of rotational variables, okay? Right, this is a common theme here. We've been doing this all along. So we know from our dictionary, right? We know that, we know that the tangential acceleration is gonna be equal to R times alpha, where alpha now is the angular acceleration. And we can plug that in here. And so we say that F then is gonna be equal to M R, times alpha, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both sides by an r, all right? And this is gonna give us m r squared times alpha. And we notice what that, um, we notice what that does for us, okay? So that, that gives us, that gives us this quantity over here, which if we go back to we go back to our list of, of, um, of rotational inertias. That's the rotational inertia for a point mass. Okay. So this then is going to be the rotational inertia of a point mass times the angular acceleration. And we're going to call this something new. We're going to call this the torque, okay? And so tau, the torque is, um, is, is, is gonna be, is gonna be um, a measure. Let's see if we can, um, so, 
Ah, we'll get there. Torque is a measure of the rotational, of the rotational effect a force has on a rigid body in, in our case, okay? In our case, the rigid body is this point mass, okay? So, so it's, going to be, it's going to be the measure of the rotational effect because clearly, right, we're going to come in here, we're going to smack this object with a force it's going to accelerate, but it's forced, right, by virtue of being tethered by this, by this uh, light rigid support, right? It's confined to move on this circular path of radius R, which is going to then have the effect of causing it to rotate about the pink axis of rotation, okay? So the torque is a measure of that, all right? As a matter of fact, in general, in general, the torque is going to be equal to R F times the sine of phi, where R is the magnitude, the magnitude of the distance from the axis of rotation to, to the object, in this case, F is going to be the magnitude, the magnitude of the force. Um, actually, what I should say is I should say from, from the axis of rotation to, to where the force is, is applied. And that makes it a little more general, okay? F is going to be the magnitude of the force. And phi is going to be the smallest, it's going to be the smallest angle between the R vector and the force vector. Okay? So in this particular case, if we want to if we want to analyze these two vectors, so here's the R vector, okay? Here's the force vector, right? If we want to analyze that, we know we have to put, we have to put those two, we have to put those two forces so that their, their uh, tails are at a common origin, okay? So if we do that, then, then we have the force, oops, we have the force in this direction. There's the force. And the R vector is in this direction. The smallest angle between them is 90 degrees. Okay, so that's why in this case, it's just gonna be R times F not RF sine of theta, okay? So the torque is a measure of the rotational effect that a force has on a rigid body, okay? And it's given by, given by this recipe, okay? So let's, um, let's look at the units here because um, the units here are a little, um, a little sketchy, okay? So torque then, which is now going to be RF sine of phi, and we'll get a better handle on how to deal with this angle stuff in a minute, okay? R is going to be in units of meters. F is going to be in units of newtons. 
and sine of theta is unitless. Okay. So the units of torque then are in Newton meters. And if you look at that for a while, you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, Newton meters is the same thing as a joule. So does torque have units of energy? And the answer is um, it does not. Okay, so we'll never say joules for torque. We will always use the units of Newton meters for torque. And you say, well, then what gives here? Well, you know, how could two um, rather disparate, um, disparate things have, have the same unit, right? Sort of energy and torque. Well, keep in mind, this is a subtle point, right? This is, this is the only place this happens in physics. The only, this is the only place where two rather disparate quantities appear to have the same units. So remember that energy, energy is a scalar, is a scalar quantity. And as it turns out, torque is a vector quantity. Now we're not gonna dwell on this too much. And if you want to uh, explore this a little bit more, right? You can, you can um, look in the book and they'll talk about this, okay? Um, what I'm gonna say, right, right now is that, is that, is that if, if a force causes a counterclockwise rotation, then we call it a positive torque. And if a force causes a clockwise rotation, then we give it a sign of negative and we say that the torque is negative. We're not going to worry about, we're not going to worry about the vector quantity of that, just the sense of rotation. Okay. So I'll call this the sense of rotation. Okay. So let's explore, um, let's explore this idea of torque just a little bit more because there's just one more, there's one more, um, one more quantity I want to get out of it. Okay, so, so let's, um, so let's imagine, let's imagine that we have a, you know, not a highly geometrical shaped object, okay. And let's say we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it about this origin, right? So here's the here's the origin, all right? Which means we're going to cause it to rotate about this point. As a matter of fact, if we were to use our pink our pink color, right? This would be the axis of rotation. Okay. And what we're going to do now is we're going to come in here. And we're going to exert a force. We're going to exert a force on this object, say right here. There it is. We're going to exert a force on this object. Now, clearly, right, um, it doesn't take it doesn't take that much thought to realize that this, this force is going to cause this object to rotate counterclockwise about this axis of rotation. Okay. So it's gonna, it's gonna actually cause a positive, a positive torque. All right. So, but let's look at this a little bit carefully because the the relationship now, right? Remember what, what R is, right? R is gonna be the distance from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied. So here's our R vector, here's our force vector, all right? Now, 
let's um, let me do a couple of things here, right? So first off, right, I'm going to I'm going to draw a a dotted line through here, and I'm also going to draw a dotted dotted line a dotted line here, which actually encompasses the force. As a matter of fact, we call this the line of action, the line of action of the force, the line of action of the force, okay? And so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna resolve, let's resolve this force into its component parts. Well, we need a coordinate system for that. And so I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use this dotted line here and I'm gonna call this angle phi, okay? And then this force now can be thought of as being made up of a force in this direction and a force in this direction. And so if we were to add those two forces up, we would get our original force back, okay? So then this, this component is going to be then F cosine of phi. This component is going to be F, whoops, it's going to be F sine of phi, okay? And You'll notice a couple of things here, right? First of all, right, that F cosine of phi, and again, I drew this green dotted line here, its line of action, its line of action actually goes through the axis of rotations, right? So here's the, here's the line, here's the line of action of F cosine of phi, okay? So you'll notice that it goes right through the, it goes right through the axis of rotation, right? And so, and so that force causes no torque, okay? So we can write that down actually, right? So any force, any force whose line of action goes through the axis of rotation causes no rotational, no rotational effect, i.e. no torque, okay? However, this, this force, the F sine of phi component, we can see that that's oriented perpendicularly to, to the R vector, and we can see pretty clearly that that force then is going to cause this, cause this object to rotate, right, counterclockwise, okay? So F cosine of, of phi, right, causes no torque, but F sine of phi causes the object to rotate counterclockwise, all right? So let's calculate what that torque is. So the torque is going to be equal to, right? It's going to be equal to R times F. The force here in question is, is F sine of phi, okay? That's going to be F sine of phi, okay? times the sine of the angle between them. And that angle now is gonna be 90 degrees. So we gotta be really careful here. We got a couple of angles going on. 
sine of 90 is one. So the torque then is gonna be R F sine of phi, okay, times one, all right? So the torque then just simply is gonna be R F sine of phi. Now I'm gonna rebundle this, right? I'm just gonna move the sine of phi closer to the R. So it's gonna be R sine of phi times F, all right? Let's go back and look at this. Let's go back and look at this diagram again, okay? Because if, if this is phi, right? Then this is phi. Okay, so uh, alternate, alternate, um, alternate in interior angles, all right? So, um, so if this is phi, then this is phi. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to, I'm going to draw a perpendicular, I'm going to draw a perpendicular from the axis of rotation to the line of action of the force, okay? And I want you to look at now, I want you to look at the blue triangle that I'm gonna draw in here, okay? So here's the blue triangle. And if this is R and this is theta, then, then this side is gonna be R sine, I'm sorry, phi, not theta, phi, okay? And so we say, we say that this is gonna be called R perpendicular times F. This then is the, this then is the perpendicular distance the perpendicular, the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation, the axis of rotation to the line of action of, of the force F. We call this the moment arm. That's an antiquated term, um, but it still lingers and we still use it. It's called the moment arm. So the perpendicular distance, right? The perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation out to the line of action of the force, right? This now is R perpendicular, okay? It's called the moment arm, okay? A lot of stuff going on in this diagram, okay? And I ask you to, to study it. And uh, the good thing about having this recorded um, is that you can listen to it multiple times, all right? So, um, and I ask you to do that to understand um, the, this notion of forces that cause rotations and those forces then generate or cause torque, okay? The force itself is important, but where that force is applied is also important. That's where R comes in, all right? So, so again, um, uh, stu study that, listen to this a, a number of times and, um, and hopefully you'll get uh, a sense uh, for this. It's not an easy, not an easy concept, right? So, um, so I think I'm going to end, I uh, think I'm going to end this module right here. And um, I might have, uh, I might have a few more things to say. I might give uh, an example of, or two of uh, how Newton's laws are used in rotational, uh, in rotational dynamics. Um, and I might uh, just end on that in uh, our last module, okay? All right, very good guys. Thank you very much. And um, keep an eye out for those last two um, 
last two uh, questions and problem sets that I will upload, okay? And uh, the directions will be uh, on them, all right? All right, very good. All right, thank you. Um, uh, good luck, guys. Take care.